Good evening, and welcome to the 15th annual Olive Trotman Memorial Lecture. My name is Jewel Ford, and it is an honor to be the moderator for this lecture once again. The Olive Trotman Memorial Lecture is one of the flagship events for the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited and has become an integral part of their anniversary celebrations. This year marks 47 years of operation for this credit union. And for that, I'd like to invite you to join me in congratulating the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Red Credit Union on this major milestone. <clears throat> Last Sunday, a large contingent of members, elected officials, and well-wishers filled the St. Luke Anglican Church for the Credit Union's anniversary church service. At this time, I invite the Reverend Davidson Bowen, rector of St. Luke Anglican Church, to come to the stage to open this event in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day with all its opportunities of pleasing you. We thank you also for the many blessings which you continue to pour into our lives. We thank you for those things which we so often take for granted. The ability to hear, to see, to touch, to move. We ask that you continue to bless, direct us. As we gather here this evening, we thank you for bringing us here safety. We ask your blessing upon the management, the board, staff, and indeed the members of the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union. We thank you for your witness across this landscape for the past 47 years. We pray that you may continue to give them a clear vision that they may continue to navigate and assist others in navigating the financial future. As we gather here this evening, we ask you to come into our midst, open our hearts and our minds, and bless us that what is said and done may be to our benefit and indeed to your glory. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. To officially welcome you to this year's lecture, I invite the president of the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union, Brother Raphael Holder, to give the welcome remarks. Distinguished speaker, Dame Selma Chapman, elected officials of the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited, and its subsidiaries, Capital Financial Services, Inc., and Capital Insurance Brokerage, specially invited guests, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. If I were a betting man, and I am not, mind you, I would place a wager this evening. I am guessing that 90% or more of the persons in this room have their own mobile phone. Maybe during the cocktail reception following, someone can help me conduct an unscientific poll to support this. The point I am making is not revolutionary. We know that mobile phones are deeply integrated within our daily lives. Each of us interacts with our cellular phones in a, various of, in a variety of ways. But how does this contemporary invention correlate with our credit union? According to www.cutimes.com, with specific reference to the 2017 credit union growth trends, and I quote, Digital channels will continue its rapid evolution, creating advances in user experience, adaptability, functionality, and channel integration. The most striking observation from the writer, though, is that, and I quote, the digital channel will help credit unions break into new geographic regions. At our core, our operations teams have been focusing on offering financial expertise in sync with an ingrained people-centric approach to financial services. It is the balance of serving members individually and collectively that creates the opportunity for technology to facilitate how we positively manage our growth. As an example, for several years, many of you have been utilizing our co-optimal suite of services to conduct a number of basic transactions, such as verifying account balances and transferring funds. Our responsibility to assist our members with becoming more comfortable with the digital service is evolving with a focus on system functionality, speed, and satisfying demand. The digital technology creates the question, what next? A question that we all need to consider and be ready for as the credit union landscape will continue to transform. I am proud to see that innovation has been a core staple 
of the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited. And I'm confident that the standard bar will remain at an elevated level with the best intentions of servicing our diverse membership. Notwithstanding regulatory standards, is it momentarily a far-fetched premise that a local credit union can establish footprints in other territories? The reality is, at this point, with vision and technology at the forefront, it simply isn't. Maybe pioneers such as brothers Keith Bourne, Ralph Boyce, Gowen Edwards, and of course, the late sister Olive Trotman, to whom we pay tribute this evening, all willingly embrace creativity and ingenuity enabling us to continue to advance at a steady clip. It seems quite appropriate and fitting that our esteemed presenter this evening is taking us on a journey back in time. I'm eagerly looking forward to the insight that she will share as a pioneer in her profession. I believe that looking back keeps us grounded, whilst looking forward keeps us on a progressive growth trajectory. In closing, I welcome you officially to this lecture and trust that the messages shared and fellowship opportunities created will leave lasting impressions on each of us. I thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Raphael. I now invite Sir Errol Warren to the stage to introduce this evening's featured speaker. Presidents of the Barbados Public Workers Union and um, all of you distinguished persons in the audience. You have in the cover of the uh, program, Dame Selma's CV. So I don't really need to repeat that. It is really a great pleasure, in fact, a privilege to introduce Dame Selma. I personally have reached the age when I'm expected to know people from their infancy. I can only claim that in relation to Dame Selma's medical career. For I've had the privilege of knowing her from a keen and very good student, to working with her through all stages of her outstanding career, and to reach the, um, the stage in my career when I, from time to time, I've had to seek her guidance. Her, her career has been devoted to the unselfish service to the people of Barbados. A service done without fanfare, without asking for any reward other than the satisfaction of seeing her patients from day one of, of life to 100 years, get better. Her quiet demeanor and gentle disposition belies an iron will to fight on behalf of her patients. I recall meeting her one morning, arriving at the door of the hospital. We both arrived rather early. And she looked rather tired, tired enough for me to say to her, it looks like you had a hard night with a long case. No, she replied. Sometimes when I come to this door, I feel tired, knowing that I'm going to fight all day to do the job they're paying me to do. And fought she did. She could wheedle anything and anyone from their hiding places whenever there was a patient to be operated on. And the confidence she imparted to her patients, whether they were very ill in bed or in the outpatients department, made her a household name in Barbados and a legend among her colleagues from students up to the directors of the hospital. 
Dan Selma. We look forward to your remarks. Good evening, everyone. Prof, thank you for, I, I knew I could rely on you to do three things. One, to establish protocol. Two, to keep to the time that I said. And for not making a lot of long talk. <laughs> Take off these. When I was invited to give this address, I was at first daunted by the list of previous speakers which had been included along with the invitation. Once I was reassured that my life story was what the organizers were interested in, I breathed a sigh of relief. I want to thank them for catapulting me down memory lane to Barbados as it was more than half a century ago, and for the opportunity to reflect on how a simple female born into a poor family from an obscure village ended up here tonight. It is my firm conviction, based on observation and personal experience, that we're all born with God-given talents. And what we do with them and where we end up in life is a result of the choices we make. These choices are spoken to by people we meet who have influenced, influenced us in one way or another. None of us are born fools. We make wise or foolish choices, and our choices define us. My father once told the story of how some 50 years ago now, he received a check for the princely sum of $3,500, payment for produce he had supplied to some government departments, and only part of which was his. He presented it to my mother with these words, E, hold this. Nobody can ever say that you never handled this much money in your life. <laughs> <coughs> this medal I have received is like that. It is to be shared with so many, most of whom are or have been unrecognized and would never in their wildest dreams conceive of any such award. To them I say, this is for you. To reach out and share, feel proud that you have played a part in putting me where I am today. This is your song, an ode to the overlooked. I will not be calling any names tonight because I don't want to leave anyone out. Some may be more influential than others, but I appreciate the help of all. Before I go any further, I should make a disclaimer. None of my close friends or family have any idea what I'm going to say. So I want to make it clear that all the opinions expressed in this presentation are mine and no one else's. Hence, family and friends, you are absolved from any blame or follow from this address. Sometimes in this address, I refer to we. This is not just the royal we. It refers to all those of my colleagues who are of my generation and those who have benefited in the same way from the teaching and experiences we both were exposed to. Okay, I came in at fifth place in a family of 12, born in the obscure village of East Point St. Philip, a place you probably never heard of. Growing up, my family consisted of my father's mother, Granny, and my parents, Mommy and Daddy for short. The village consisted of all those families from East Point, Lighters Hill, Seely Hill, Ragged Point Lay House, Marleyville, St. Catharines, to name a few. And the schools were the St. Catharines Mixed School, and later the Christchurch Girls Foundation School, have to give the full title, and Queen's College. All these people and institutions played a part in my development. Let's start with the family. My grandmother, a fiercely independent woman who lived with us and worked for her own money. She had what daddy described as the hard work gene, which she passed on. She was one of 12 children, and even though I don't remember the details of why she never had the privilege of attending school, um, I don't remember the details. This created in her, as in most of her generation, great respect for education or book learning, as they ca called it. She had great ambition for her three children. And indeed, she wanted daddy to become a policeman. But he failed the test. He was vertically challenged. <laughs> Even though she was illiterate and worked as a wayside vendor in Tweeside Road, Carrington Village, she was blessed with native intelligence. 
There was no one who, could, who knew arithmetic like my grandmother. She would add, subtract, multiply, and divide faster than any computer. And you couldn't fool her and bring back wrong change if she sent you to buy something from the village shop. She, like others in the village, formed, like Sister Olive Trotman, their own cooperative and had their own banking system, the meeting turn or the susu. When this was arranged, it made lump sums of money available to them at critical times, back to school, Christmas. And this banking system these simple folk had still operates today. She was the one who told us the stories of the old folks. She played games with us, brought treats for us, especially made Bajan sweets, comforts, and fowl cocks. Brought us starlights and bombs for Guy Fox Day. She would exchange some of the produce she sold for fruits, little mangoes and oranges from her fellow vendors from the Low Islands, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, etc. And three of us she took with her on the occasional Sunday afternoon outing to Tudor Bridge to visit some of her daughter's family. From my grandmother, I learned to respect all the folks and to listen to them. They had a lot to pass on. But most of all, I learned book learning is not common sense. My parents, they were to my mind a breed apart. Before they were married, they had gotten their priorities in life right. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. That's from Proverbs 3. Having settled that, they understood that life was not now a matter of throwing up their hands and saying God will provide, but a matter of developing to the fullest the talents he gave them. Daddy got the hard work gene too, but along with that went vision and understanding. He observed that people who made money were those who dealt with food. The shoemaking trade he learned from his uncle did not pay. Too often people forgot to collect the repaired shoes or promised to pay but ne either never did or certainly didn't pay on time. This observation led him to farm. We grew cucumbers, tomatoes, beans, carrots, etc., and we kept animals pigs, cows, sheep, fowls, etc. This meant that as children, we learned how to work in planting, yes, but more so in food harvesting. We learned to pull the carrots, beets, eschalots, etc., and to help prepare them for my grandmother to pack in her basket to go off to sell. As far as the animals went, we learned to pick meat for the sheep, gather cane tops for the cow cows and crop season, and my brothers learned to graze the cows beside the, work, the road. Everybody worked, every man, woman, and child, as hard work never killed anybody. All the children had chores, before school and after school, and these had to be completed before school or work, school work or lessons, and certainly before playtime. We were kept busy because the devil finds work for idle hands to do. The adults were taking no chances at us entertaining the devil, so work was mandatory. Playtime was precious. A little later, my father became a speculator, going around to the plantations and buying and reaping yams, potatoes, edos to supply four government departments, the two hospitals, the general and mental, the prison and the lazarette or the leprosarium. He didn't have money at first, so he built up trust. This was a deal that he made with plantation owners. Trust me to reap your crops, and I guarantee you payment when the government check comes. So said, so done. He was a man of his word. His vision led him to be part of the initiative that saw Barbados exporting yams, breadfruits, and avocados to Great Britain in the early 60s. And to eventually buy a farm where he set up a dairy farm, which was way ahead of his time. He kept chickens and supplied the flight kitchen with eggs, grew vegetables on a large scale, developed a variety of fast-growing sweet potatoes, but his specialty was in the production of the largest, sweetest watermelons in the market. My mother was the keeper of the home. She was responsible for using what daddy provided to feed and clothe us. Resourceful is what she was. She knew how to put elastic in food so it stretched to feed all of us and whoever else dropped in at mealtimes. She used her skills as a dressmaker to clothe us. We had designer clothes. She was a strict housekeeper with definite rules. She guarded what crossed the threshold. No radio. That was a bad influence. Plenty books. 
all the books she'd read as a child and National Geographic and Reader's Digest, etc. No comics. They were not, an ex uh, not examples of proper English. She was a lady with a plan to produce of her 12 children, eight gentlemen and four ladies. She didn't bargain for 12 children, each as different from the other as night from day. But she tried, and she had help from the villagers and our teachers. My parents, like the adults of the day, had eyes that could see through walls and around corners, and ears that could hear even the faintest whisper from behind closed doors at the other end of the house. They gave us a sense of identity. We knew who we were, and we knew our boundaries. For example, school report cards had two sections. Progress, that was academic performance, and conduct, which was deportment and behavior. Conduct was the first item scrutinized on the report, and it had better be good, or better than good. Progress was of less importance, provided you had done your best. Daddy had a saying, if you've done your best, no one else can do better. The expectation always was that you would do your best. We were all our father's children. He wanted 12 children, and so he had the 12 tribes of Israel. And he worked hard, day and night, to support us. He neither expected nor asked for handouts, but he knew to appreciate help when it came. Providing for us was made a little easier with the advent of free secondary and tertiary education. My siblings. My brothers taught me how to fight for and achieve gender equality. They, as boys, had greater freedom than the girls. Their chores were outdoors for the most part. So tagging along in, in their adventures, keeping up and learning to keep your mouth shut, if you were allowed in on the escapades, was far better than being cooped up in a house, unfair in a piece of cloth by pushing the needle and thread through, repeatedly through it. <laughs> because of my older sister, a model child, the teacher said so, I learned to be an individual to tune out and turn off when adults, especially the teachers, started down the road of, your sister would never do whatever crime it was I had allegedly committed. What about the village families? They mostly all had the same attitude to education. In fact, one may well quote the words of the mighty sparrow in his song, education is essential. Education, education, this is the foundation. Our rising population needs sound education. And the chorus went, Children go to school and learn well. Otherwise, later on in life, you go catch real help. Without an education in your head, your whole life will be pure misery. You're better off dead. There's no room in this whole wide world for an uneducated little boy or girl. Don't allow idle companions to lead you astray to earn tomorrow. You've got to learn to today. We were bombarded by adults asking, how you like school? You doing well in school? What do you want to be when you leave school? If you were foolish enough to not pay attention to teacher while in school, you were trifling with education. They would have given the IT, education they would have given the IT to have had. Their comments were scathing and succinct. You are no better than a whole half idiot or puppet. You want to work in the field? Boy, use your noggin. The village helped in establishing our identity too. They knew everyone. She's Mrs. Clark from the Lighthouse Gap, second husband's sister on her father's side, and your cousin twice removed. <laughs> they also knew every animal in the village, who every animal in the village belonged to. It was Mr. Jordan's dog that miss, bit Miss Morrill. Mr. Hart's cow that got away and went into Miss B's ground rooted in her kitchen garden. Even some of the animals had sense too, you know. The pig knew just whose batch of cultivated land to head for. We as children learned to be fast than Usain Bolt, because when you heard a cry, cow or pig get away, you had to be able to outrun the animal and head it off from destroying the neighbor's crops. Failure was greeted with fitting punishment. The village and the primary school taught us about making choices. Every bush, tree, cane, ground, and grass piece had adult eyes and ears so that any misbehavior on the road to or from school was noted. Instagram had no edge on the rate at which news like that reached home. <laughs> Before you, even if you took the shortcut to home. As a child, you therefore had to pick your battles. Decide whether or not the satisfaction of beating an enemy to pulp was worth the two sets of licks that, you would, in, that would inevitably follow. 
one from parents and the other from the headmaster for fighting in school uniform. Justice in those days was swift and certain. The law had weight, and the full weight of the law was a reality. We learned conflict resolution too. Settle it among yourselves, don't involve the adults, as both sides will be punished equally. Primary and secondary school, I am grateful for teachers who cared enough to expose us to not just the three R's, but to life and its realities. They had a mission to instill, or at least, at least the rudiments of a, an education in all of their charges. They had PTA meetings too. Anywhere and every encounter between parents and teacher was an occasion to give or get a report on each child's conduct and progress. We were taught to be on time was a necessary rule, to respect your school uniform, the environment, teachers, most adults, and especially the old in society because manners maketh man, woman, and child. But to get back to my story, my primary school teacher, still alive today, reminded me that I told him when I was at school that I was going to be a doctor because I was going to look after him when he was old. It seemed that once those words were spoken, doors opened up that paved the way. My parents were encouraged to send me to sit an exam which would allow me to enter the prep school at the Christchurch Girls Foundation, which my older sister attended. So at the tender age of eight, I entered that school and spent the next seven years there. There are three outstanding memories from my time there. One was a school song. Not for oneself, but for all. Non sibi said omnibus. And that addressed all aspects of life. The first verse spoke about the past. As the book of life is open for our eager eyes to read. Yes, yeah, school opened my eyes. And it fed my hunger for knowledge. And the chorus said, Not for oneself, but for all. May we evermore recall, whether good or ill befall, non sibi said omnibus. The second verse refers to the present. Here, the quiet ordered hours brings the joy of work's rewards. So there's joy to, that came from working. And it was not to be, not for oneself, but for all. The third verse addressed the future. In the life that lies before us, when our school days are no more, you were to remember. It was not for oneself, but for all. Singing this non sibi said omnibus was engraved in our DNA after seven years of singing it. The second thing I learned was don't expect life to be fair. When I was 11 years old, the running behind escape animals, exercising calves up and down our gap, and dodging siblings bent on extracting vengeance before you could reach the safety of home fully paid off. I had a brief moment of glory as Victrix Ludorum for the school. So off I went to represent the school at the girls in school sports that year. We had been taught that you should breast the tape to win the race. In my, imagine my chagrin when leading the field and about to breast the tape, my nearest rival stretched forth her hand and grabbed the tape. I was awarded first place. No amount of judges' decision is final, and talk of being sportsmanlike had any effect. As far as I was concerned, the rules had been breached. That was the end of my athletics career. But it taught me, don't expect life to be fair. The third thing was that teachers cared. Our headmistress was Enid Lynch, BA. She thought very highly of my older sister, who had gone through school as a top student, an angel in behavior, and had reached the elevated status of head girl. When my sister fell ill while at University in Jamaica and came back home, Edie Lynch BA found her home one afternoon and came to inquire of my sister's well-being. I didn't even know she knew where we lived. But I'll always remember she cared. My time at Christchurch Girls Foundation School came to an end when I completed my O-levels and off I went to Queen's College, our rival academic school. Having to switch schools meant I had to learn to adjust to change. I learned that life is a one-way journey with different stretches or adventures, and one should welcome each new experience as it comes, savor it, extract what you could, and look forward to the next one just around the corner. To the non sibi said omnibus was added, life is the road to tread in dust and labor and heat. Thought of the goal is sweet. When you rise with your arms complete, carry the light. That was the QC school song. 
so a life was meant for living. At QC, I was encouraged to apply for a scholarship at a time when the brighter girls were planning on having an initial attempt at A-levels and then return to school, but in another year doing the same syllabus to get a better grade and then apply for a Barbados scholarship. I've never been one for repeating experiences. So I applied as I did my A-levels. To the delight of all, teachers, daddy, etc., I was awarded a Barbados government exhibition to study medicine in Mona, Jamaica. My mother was not happy. Another daughter to go to Jamaica, suppose I came back sick. I did not have all the required qualifications to take up the scholarship that year, so I had to spend a year at Cave Hill, at Cave Hill studying, among other subjects, the physics, physics I had not studied at Ferris Foundation School. It was a year in which my mother got to adjust to the thought of my going to university in Jamaica, a year to change her mind. But let me backtrack a little to my plan to be a doctor. 60 years ago, ill health was a luxury the poor could not afford. A sick family member, especially if, the, if it was a breadwinner, would mean no work and therefore no income. There was no such humane consideration as paid sick leave. Our parents and the people of the day therefore practiced social and preventive medicine. Social, anybody sick? The whole village had their remedies to offer which bush or concoction of bushes should be used, what bush to wrap up with or bathe in, and what didn't kill would fatten. <laughs> they had limes or lemons and root ginger or ginger powder to make tea. Who did not know the benefits of mustard oil, Canadian healing oil, tisane de Durban, and iodex and candle grease? The druggists at the doctor's shop would prescribe and concoct medications to treat whatever you needed. You just had to describe the symptoms and he prescribed the soup. He was a poor man's doctor. The preventive part was keeping the children well. Bush teas, castor oil purges, liver oil, worm medicine, etc. We got plenty of exercise of body, mind, and soul, had plenty of vegetables, we grew them, milk, and fruits. We knew where every fruit tree was located. So dunk, sugar apples, monkey sugar, and something called bread and cheese, and almond and almond nuts made good dietary supplements. If one child had measles or whooping cough, all the children were kept together, so they all shared the illness together. You had one set of nursing. When vaccinations were due, they were administered by the public health nurse visiting the school. The parents and the teachers all made sure that all the children attended school that day. There was a strict roll call. No one escaped. You couldn't hide in the toilet. In that day, too, everyone knew that when you had to go to hospital, that the case was serious, and you might not come back. <laughs> All that being so, my encounter with doctors was limited to four occasions. Once when I fractured my collarbone, for entry to secondary school, for university entrance, and once when my mother was ill, a baby case. Let me explain. All 12 of us were home deliveries. The midwife, Granny Squires, would arrive when summoned, put on water to boil, don her nurse's cap, and a stiff start on her lily white apron before assuming her duties. We children were shooed out of the way, and usually by the next morning we'd be told the stork had come and we had a new brother or sister. The stork was a frequent visitor. <laughs> Granny Squires usually spent a couple of days and then left and everything was normal. On one occasion, though, something had gone wrong, and Daddy was dispatched to bring the doctor who arrived, held hasty consultations with the midwife and the adults in the house, and left with instructions that my mother was to remain in bed and rest. That time, Granny Squire spent a long time, and we had to be on our best behavior. I have other vivid memories of experiences that cemented my desire to be a doctor. When as a child, my father's uncle died from asthma because there was nothing more the GP could do, my little brain registered that. When a little older, a younger brother developed asthma, and in spite of the chest, the chest being kept warm with flannel vests, rubber with various concoctions, being fed various bush teas, he would still wheeze, especially when he caught a fresh cold. I would lie awake listening to him wheeze the whole night through, wanting to help but not knowing how. And, and knowing that we didn't have the means and that he didn't have the time to take him to the hospital. 
listening and longing for morning because it was well known that if you were ill in the night and you made it to morning, all would be well. When one brother made a habit of stumping his toes and losing his nails, I got to bandage your toes. I could help. When another brother sliced open his foot on a corned beef top and came running into the house with blood spurting and my mother hastily disappeared, mommy didn't do blood. I got to play doctor and press the cut. In my little mind, it needed stitches and I was game to use needle and thread, but he wouldn't have any. When, as a secondary school student, I witnessed a horrific motor vehicle accident and had to stand helplessly by just feeling that if I just knew how, I could have helped. When my grandmother in later years developed the dreaded sugar, after sustaining some minor injury to her little toe and spent weeks attending a local GP, only to be told at the end there was nothing more he could do and he ordered her to hospital. When she was admitted to hospital where the doctors cut off first her toe, then after some weeks half her foot, and then weeks later, her leg above the knee and her independence. I felt better could have been done since she had attended the doctor from early. I had been impotent at all those times. It was time to go and learn how to help. I knew my parents had no money and 12 of us to rear, but that didn't bother me. I was going to be a doctor. It was not a case, it was not a case of President Obama's audacity of hope. It was the indomitable, indomitable power of faith that paved the way. Commit, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So, having won the exhibition and completed that year of pre-med at, Cave, at the Cave Hill campus, in October of 1970, with my mother's leap of faith, she'd withdrawn her objections. She was reconciled to my going off to Jamaica. She made all my clothes and got me ready. My father's belief that I would. My family's support in the form of a Timex watch, my, my first. From one brother, advice from my older sister, the model child, on how to live a victorious life. A little pocket change from one of my secondary school teachers. And with complete confidence, I left home, all 61 inches and 98 pounds of me, <laughs> to, to embark on the adventure of a lifetime becoming a medical doctor. I was on my way. I had lots of help provided for me, for me. A Barbados government exhibition that gave me the chance. A university that took seriously its mandate given by the regional governments to develop and harness the raw intellectual talent of their students so they would become individuals with honed leadership abilities and service skills that would enable them to face any challenges and prepare them to return to their several islands and be pioneers in the development of their island, islands. There were Jamaican families who took over where my parents left off and nurtured me along with their own children. There were university preclinical tutors who instilled in us the rudiments of doctrine, doctrine and clinical teachers who taught by example and out of care and concern for what their efforts would produce. I had learned to grasp every opportunity for learning, for learning that was provided. When after the first 18 months of med school, I was offered a chance to spend a year at the University of Leeds in England studying biochemistry in, the, in relation to medicine, I went on hesitatingly. There I was exposed to the efficiency of the British, how to get things done with minimum fuss and in a timely fashion and to the world of research and the lengths to which its dedicated followers were prepared to go in their efforts to advance knowledge and science. Finally, in 1976, after six years of preparation, I made it out of medical school. It was time to enter the world of work. In the working world, I had lots of mentors at all levels. Senior nurses, the orderlies, the anesthetic aides, the medical staff, etc., etc. They all knew more than I did, and I was willing and ready to learn. They taught me some of the how of practicing medicine. Now, I had left medical school with the idea that I would be a pathologist, you know, the medical examiner type that you see on TV. And I would be able to make the final diagnosis, and I would show the clinicians their mistakes. When I had therefore completed that year of internship, I was all start to set on that path. I lasted about 10 days. Dreams and realities don't always mesh. Dead patients were just that, 
high school blocks that nothing I could ever say or do would ever make a difference to them. Now I had been exposed to the main branches of medicine during my internship. Obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, internal medicine, and general surgery. Which to choose? Obstetrics and gynecology dealt only with women. Most of them young, not even sick. They were only pregnant. And furthermore, that would take me into areas of ethical dilemmas, the whole question of abortions and teenage pregnancies, etc. Not for me. Pediatrics, children, especially newborns, could in the twinkling of an eye go from healthy to sick unto death to death in a matter of hours. Plus, like obstetrics and gynecology, only one section of the human race was being catered to. No, not for me. Internal medicine, a lot of hypotheses and long talk. Those physicians could talk pretty. But the treatment for most things was something called steroids, the cure-all. Another thing was that you could never get rid of the patients. They were always coming back for repeat. <laughs> repeat prescriptions or with the same problems all over again. So surgery was the only thing that made sense. You could actually help people. You did an operation, saw the patient get better, and out of hospital or clinic and back to their normal lives. So I boldly went and asked my surgery consultant if I could return to the department. To his credit, he didn't say no. It never crossed my mind until I was writing this that he could have said no, especially given the fact that there were no other females in the field of general surgery at the time. And the previous general surgeon, imported from outside the region, had a reputation as a disaster. She was James Bond, not not seven, licensed to kill. <laughs> That I was entering a man's world and that was supposed to have implications never crossed my consciousness. Growing up with eight brothers, I learned I could do and did most everything they could. Pitch marbles, climb trees, make kites, cricket balls. So working in a so-called man's world was nothing new. I just treated my colleagues as my brothers. I did not ask for nor expect any concessions for being female. They didn't make me one though. They modulated their language when I was wrong or apologized for their French. <laughs> we worked in teams, each with a hierarchy, consultant, registrar, senior health officer. When I rejoined the surgical service, it was at the bottom of the totem pole, but my plan was no patient on that service should or would be undergoing any procedure that I did not know about and was not present to assist with or witness the surgery if it was at all possible. If this meant reaching the hospital before 6.30 a.m. and before the consultant, then so be it. Had to be there. How else could I be expected to properly look after a patient when I had not seen, I wasn't present at the procedure, I had not seen what had been done, and I didn't know why or how it was done? Because sometimes there are unexpected findings during an operation. You might have to modify the procedure that you'd planned. Every chance I had to scrub in for a procedure, I took so I could see every step of the operation firsthand. I stuck like a bird to the operating surgeons. My colleagues soon realized that I, I was not a threat to them. I just wanted to learn to be a surgeon, just like them. They actually made room and time for me. If there, if there were not enough sterile gowns for me to scrub in for a particular operation, they showed me where I could place a, a footstool and watch what was happening. In those did, days, we did real general surgery. The only exceptions were eyes, ear, nose, and throat, and obstetrics. We did, at times, end up doing some gynecology. The broken bones, the desiccated joints, the trauma, accidental or deliberate, the hearts and great vessels that had been tickled with an assailant's weapon came to us. My team did some chest and simple extracardiac procedures, so we were, we were exposed to basic chest surgery as well. I'd been given the opportunity, so I set about to learn everything I could. Given my grandmother's hard work gene, my father's observational skills, willing mentors whom I shadowed, I acquired surgical skills, and after brief stints in Scotland with helpful colleagues and friends, finally in 1982, I passed the postgraduate exam and became a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. 
Thank you. I know how the essential credential Sparrow spoke of in his Calypso. For employment, yes, employment, you must be intelligent. So it's essential, very essential, to have your credentials. I must make the point that for me, there was never any gender issues. I had defective vision and faulty hearing. If negative things were said or comments made, I didn't hear them. I don't remember that they ever were said, though. I never had defeat or you cannot do as part of my vocabulary. And I really don't remember if there were other females who did the fellowship exam when I did. I guess it must have been, but that, that never registered. Between 1984 and 1985, I went back to Jamaica for a year of pediatric surgery experience. This was a response to an encouragement from my mentor who had a vision of how the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and medical services in Barbados could and should develop. A year later, again with encouragement, advice, and the help of a British Commonwealth Fellowship, I went back to the UK to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Hackney Road and to the prestigious Great Ormond Street in London and the Bristol Children's Hospital for further experience in pediatric surgery. After this stint, I was made a consultant. The responsibilities of a consultant were nothing new. I had been given the privilege of acting for various members of the department previously, so I did have some experience. Becoming a consultant sur surgeon meant that I had a mandate to continue to help train both under and postgraduate doctors, to teach others that I, as I had been taught, and to provide the best surgical care to as many patients as possible. It simply meant, too, that the buck now stopped at me. We had learned from very early that even if, as medics, we had issues with salaries and working conditions, that industrial action and provision of medical services made very poor bedfellows. The patient's interest should always come first. We had also learned that medical research was, was not just desirable, but essential if we were to keep improving the standard of care we offer to our patients. Since the internet was not around in those early days. One way of keeping up to date, other than reading medical journals, was to attend international conferences. This allowed us to see the world, expose us to different cultures, allowed us to meet colleagues in the same field, exchange experiences, ideas, etc. It allowed us to network. Among some of the greatest gifts my mentors had, by demonstration given me, was the realization that excellence in work was an achievable and desirable goal. That patients, the people we serve, were to be treated with respect. They, the patients, were entrusting themselves to our care. They were literally bearing their all, their bodies, their dignity, their fears, their hope for help, at a time when they were most vulnerable. My mentors thought that patients should be treated with compassion, gentleness, and the assurance that we always had their best interests at heart. We learned to listen and hear what was not being said, but we needed to know, to see what patients did not want to show, but hope we would find. We were helped to develop our craft, to learn from our mistakes by holding them up to the light of the constructive criticism of our colleagues, to recognize our limitations and when, how, and from whom to seek assistance or a second opinion. The service we provided was not about us, or how we would look, or how others saw or would see us. It was about the patients, their lives, and how we could make them better. We were shown and encouraged to reach beyond the hospital into the community, hence the community outreach clinic, to reach out to our neighbors in the Caribbean community, to offer services and surgical advice as, need, as necessary. Their referred patients came to us, or occasionally we went to them. We surgeons form a health, a health health network as dictated by the requirements of the times. We collectively were not always successful. Sometimes we fail, but at least we try, learn from our mistakes and pressed on. I have lived to see the initiative that led to the development of our National Health Service implemented. This meant that all citizens now had access to the best care the system could and did provide and not have to worry about costs. I've witnessed the birth and development of local and regional training for, pro 
local and regional training programs for surgeons. Our young doctors no longer have to pull their pockets to go off to sit international exams. I've seen more females enter surgical postgraduate programs and graduate as surgeons. Before this, there was only one other local female who had undergone the same training as I had. It was an honor in 2000 to be asked to be an, ex an examiner for the University of the West Indies Pediatric Surgery Postgraduate Training Program. And I as I did this over the, the years, it was notable that of the 10 graduates from that program, only three were males. In other words, there were seven females. Now, June this year will make 41 completed years since I left med school. In that time, the frontiers of knowledge have expanded by leaps and bounds, so that with the internet, every man, woman, and child is half of a medical expert. <laughs> Yet, some things remain the same. People, and in increasing numbers, are still, like my grandmother, succumbing to the ravages of diabetes mellitus. My time for that battle is rapidly passing, but I still consider it a responsibility to plead with, beseech, implore, provoke, cajole, inspire those coming after to see the need, pick up the torch, and go shed some better light on diseases like these. I still feel the responsibility to help them see the need to strive for excellence and do their part in the battle for control of these and other diseases. It's been a wonderful life. A life made wonderful by all those people, patients included, along the way, who help us to develop our God-given talents and make the right choices, to observe, see what was needed to be done, and do it. Whatever your hands find to do, do it. It has been a privilege, a trust, and a responsibility. So, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Some little idea of how and why I practice medicine over the years. I didn't have or make much time for record keeping. There's so much to do, so many to try to help, and so little time. But apparently others were keeping track. Hence this comfort, honor, which I have accepted very much, is on the behalf of all these overlooked people who helped me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Dame Salma, on behalf of the Board of Management, um, the, the management and the um, staff of the Barbers Public Works Credit Union, we wish to offer this. Small token of appreciation <laughs> for being our featured speaker here tonight. It was an incredible, invigorating um, life story, and we very much appreciate it. I think I've been moderating these lectures now for the last five or six years. And every year, I'm completely blown away by the breadth of speakers that they have, by the, the breadth of knowledge in every sphere, and that they are homegrown talent. I don't think we really appreciate, as Barbadians, the kind of people that we raise and nourish in this country and then just send them out into the world to shine their light. Another big round of applause for Dame Salma. We're now at the close of this evening's proceedings, and to offer the vote of thanks, I invite Sister Clorinda Allen, the Group CEO of the Barbados Public Workers Cooperative Credit Union Limited, to the podium. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Protocol having been established, it's my priv privilege to now offer the vote of thanks. I will be as brief as I can be, but there are some things that have to be said. As the group CEO of this wonderful organization that is, is my blessing to lead, I have many responsibilities. But one of my most fulfilling self-assigned tasks is to spearhead the selection process for the featured speaker of the Olive Trotman Memorial Lecture. 
This lecture series is in its 15th year, and I am in my 10th year of being privileged and honored to personally meet a diverse and inspiring group of homegrown Barbadian thought leaders, some who come from the diaspora, who willingly oblige and travel from faraway lands to present for us every year. Last year, our presenter traveled from as far as Dubai. For them all, as for me, this lecture, in commemoration of the life and work of Sister Olive Trotman, is indeed a labor of love. It is therefore with a great sense of pride that I offer the vote of thanks this evening. Genuine, humble, respectful, dignified are some of the words that come to mind and some of the words that have been mentioned to me whenever I said to anyone in response to the question who's going to be presenting this evening and I said it's going to be Dame Selma Jackman. Without exception, those are the words that were spoken. The one most frequently spoken though was humble and humble not in a humble in a genuine way, not in a sense of what so often is mistaken for humility, what I call mo modesty. People spoke with heartfelt conviction in relation to how she cared for people, how she related to people, and how she gave of her best on each and every occasion when the situation arose. So Dame Selmer, it is an honor to have you as the featured speaker this evening. When we first spoke after the invitation, the request was sent, inviting you to be our speaker, you asked, you said, well, don't remember exact words, but it was pretty much, if you think I can uh, do justice. And I said that I think you have a compelling story and your presentation this evening has very much borne it out. Your compelling story confirms for all of us that success is a never ending journey moving in tandem with its twin service, which is the destination. That journey is all fraught with challenges which not only test, but refine our metal and our pluck. Yes, pluck. I remember that word as I was finalizing this vote of thanks. It's an old word. My mother used it quite often. She admired pluck in people and she herself had a lot of pluck. <laughs> Dame Selma, Barbados is exceedingly fortunate to have you as a daughter of our soil. And equally so, this credit union is blessed and highly favored to add your name to its honor roll of speakers. Thank you, Dame Selma, for your time and the compelling story of your journey, both in your individual life and in your professional life. So Errol Warren, thank you for your brilliant introduction. Indeed, your introduction of Dame Selma, though short, wonderfully set the tone for the presentation we followed. Our appreciation is extended as well to Father Davidson Boyne, Rector of St. Luke Anglican Church. Father Davidson, we thank you for offering the blessing this evening. We know that you had an in another engagement this evening but you still managed to fit us in into your schedule. Thanks very much for that as well. We thank the elected officials for the various roles which they performed this evening. Brother Raphael, for your welcome remarks. He keeps reminding us of the potential of the credit union to embrace the digital technology as a tool and to execute our mission and serve our members. Thank you. 
Sister Christina John for graciously agreeing to make the presentation to Dame Salma for us. As they say, lights, camera, action, we are also grateful to the team behind the lights that make this evening impossible. Sorry, possible. <laughs> to the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Caterers SM Events who managed and coordinated this event, and all the other production staff who, ex who assisted with the execution of this evening, thank you. And to Jewel Ford, who year after year so efficiently moderate and manage these proceedings. We thank you for your very capable skills. <clears throat> Accounts such as um, those delivered by Dame Salma this evening resonate with the older ones amongst us, amongst us and create nostalgic moments. But I believe that while the youngsters here this evening have been provided with useful insights into Barbados's past, they will each take away a substantial number of nuggets, which hopefully they will use to assist them in creating meaningful and successful futures. Special thanks to all the youngsters here this evening, especially members of staff. I see many of the younger members of staff and I'm very glad that they're here this evening. I remembered when this lecture series first started, I took it upon myself to go around um, to line staff and encourage them. And many were reluctant to come because they thought that the le le a lecture is a boring thing. And then they started coming for the line. And then they started coming earlier than the line. I know that I see that they're coming at the very beginning and staying through the lecture and staying on as well to enjoy the lime. So thanks very much for keeping this um, event alive. I want to say thanks very much to a special group as well, a group of young persons from my home church, the Barry Nazarene Church, who I know are here this evening. They came last year without an invitation from myself and this year they're here again. So thanks very much. I'm happy that more young people are coming because um, as I can't remember who said uh, this evening during the process, more young people need to be made aware of what it takes for success and also the challenges that some of the older folks, some people in my age group and older had to undergo in undergo in order to achieve the success. Sometimes youngsters look on and see success and they think it's an overnight thing. It's not. There are challenges, you have to persist, and you have to keep moving forward, whether you move forward slowly, swiftly, at whatever pace. So thanks very much to everyone, but very special thanks to the youngsters who have a whole lot of activities on any given day of the week, but they've made it their business to be here this evening. And last, but by no means least, I want to say thanks to, publicly say thanks to my secretary, Mrs. Carrie Curtin, who is really more than a secretary. She's a critical part of this selection process. We just roll together well in this journey. I cannot thank her enough. I know that she's going to kill me for saying this because she's very modest and she doesn't like to be, you know, public. She doesn't like this public thing. I also welcome her, uh, say thanks to her mother for coming. She's a repeat attendee year after year, and I know that she thoroughly enjoyed this evening's presentation, taking her back into her younger days. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, on behalf of the board management and staff of the credit union, our subsidiaries, Capita Financial Services, Inc., and Capita Insurance Brokers, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a sincere pleasure being your moderator once again, and please enjoy the remainder of the evening. If you need to leave us, please travel safely. Good night.